it's a little risky. We're uh, putting out in public our, uh, our disagreements. And uh, this is in the form of a uh, interfaith dialogue. So in the interfaith dialogue, uh, as you know, uh, interfaith uh, work is people within, uh, say, Islam, different sects. Let's take the Sunnis and the Shiites who are at war. They should have a dialogue, don't you think? And um, throughout the world, there are dialogues being convened. Even within, they're called intra-faith or interfaith. And this is what I would call an intra-faith an intra-faith dialogue. So I wanted uh, to um, find a way to do this, and um, I asked uh, my old friend uh, Chuck Thurston, who's on the, my far right, uh, to, uh, who's been an outspoken critic of the idea of celestial contact in, within the teaching mission, to present his point of view. And I think it's a, a important to understand we all have different points of view on every phenomenon, and we need to know what each other thinks about these things, even if it's controversial. And we can do it. We can be civil in, uh, in our disagreements. And you know, they're not necessarily disagreements. They're just different perspectives. Uh, Chuck thinks there's a lot at stake, and I agree. There's a lot at stake here. Uh, I've known Chuck for almost 40 years. He is uh, a champion um, Urantia book student, uh, uh, one of the great experts. And um, his work is uh, always uh, scholarly. His work is uh, something I respect. Uh, so I wanted uh, Chuck to speak to us. Uh, I also uh, invited um, two more to, to join us. Meredith Tenney, you've met before. Uh, Mare has a, um, what she calls a moderate view of celestial contact. Um, she uh, actually has a view more close to mine, which is that some of, this, some of this contact is questionable, and it has sub subjectivity. There's human elements and contamination in it. Also, um, it causes many problems in the interpretation of the text because we now have uh, new texts and they get confused with the core text and you get uh, a muddle sometimes on some of these issues. And we have discovered that people uh, in the in Urantia movement uh, are confused because now we have 40,000 additional pages to work with. Uh, there's a lot of issues uh, here uh, that uh, are up in the air. Um, I, I hope I didn't uh, say things that are not quite your position, but anyway, that's the kind of the more moderate position. And then uh, Rick Voss, who's another uh, champion, your Rancher Book student, goes back way back to the 70s, uh, is uh, going to join us. Uh, Rick has a, a highly experiential relationship to this that he's going to share, which Jerry Lane did also earlier. And um, I'd like those who uh, support Chuck's position to also speak out and take the mic and share your experiences as well uh, so we can have balance. Uh, so I'm now going to allow you to start, Chuck, um, if you like, or would you like? I think we can start, because you just heard my position on the teaching yeah, sure. mission. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just let you start, and we'll go. Um, we'll time you. Um, for uh, a little over five minutes. I'm sorry, this time is short. Okay. Well, I, my point of view comes from the Arantia book. I guess you might say I'm a loyal, I'm loyal to the Arantia book. I prefer to, I, I, the, I found that it contains great truth, so I try to uphold what it says, trying to understand what it says. And one of my problems with the teaching mission, and the con some of the content in the teaching mission, is that it contradicts the Arantia book. So I'm trying to sort that out, trying to figure out what's, what's behind that, why, why that would be happening. So it, it, your answer book talks about the possibility for contact between spirit personalities and human mind. It does not say that that's not possible, but that it requires special arrangements to make that happen. Now, the, the distinction needs to be made between divine presence so the presence of God within our, within our minds, the presence of the Mother Spirit through her circuits and her literal presence within reality in every way, and the associative presence of Jesus. This is not in question. You know, this is these are divine presences that are provided for us as spiritual resources. Where it gets a little trickier is when you start talking about other spirit 
personalities. And what makes us tricky is the difference in mind. So we're, we're material beings. You know, we have a physical body, we have a physical brain, and a very particular type of mind circuitry has been provided for us that's broadcast by the Mother Spirit throughout the universe that enables us to have the consciousness that we have, to enable our material human consciousness. Spirit beings that descend to come down to help us, they have different circuits. They have a different type of mind. So to bridge between these two types of mind, between a spirit mind and a human mind, requires the assistance of this sort of mid type of being referred to as a midware, who's kind of in between the physical and the spiritual. So they can connect to both kinds of mind and make a bridge and actually allow spirit contact within the human mind, direct mind to mind. But in the Urantia book's teaching, this is very rare and unusual. It's not an ordinary circumstance, and it requires very special arrangements to make this happen. <coughs> so uh, this issue of the adjudication of the Lucifer Rebellion is a, is, a, is a big point where I think there's a major contradiction between the teachings in the Urantia book and what some of the, uh, the transmitted um, messages are saying. So I don't want to get into, you know, we don't have time necessarily to talk about what I think might be going on with these transmitted messages and why they contradict the Arantia book. You know, that's kind of a separate issue. But if I can just briefly try to explain what the Arantia book says about adjudication that's different and it's in contradiction. Um, perhaps the simplest way to explain this would be to say that there's a difference between adjudication and verdict. So in the... Universe tribunals where this case of Gabriel versus Lucifer, where the where the rebellion is being, uh, where the verdict is being reached in terms of the, of the, of of the rebe where the rebellion is being um, um, adjudicated. Well, see that that the verdict has been reached in the rebellion, but the adjudication requires unanimous has to be unanimous throughout the entire system of Satania. In other words, adjudication in the Arantia Book's terminology refers to the final judgment of the rebellion. And this requires a decision on the part of every personality involved, even on the human level. In, within any sphere of influence where the rebellion is still ongoing, the policy of the universe is to have the leaders of the rebellion within that sphere of influence remain free so that the process, this process of coming to a decision can be reached most quickly. <clears throat> I'll just read one brief passage. Uh, here it says, the divine minister of Salvington, which is the mother spirit, issued as her third independent proclamation a mandate directing that nothing be done to half cure cowardly suppress or otherwise hide the hideous visage of rebels and rebellion. The angelic hosts were directed to work for full disclosure and unlimited opportunity for sin expression as the quickest technique of achieving the perfect and final cure of the plague of evil and sin. In our case, on this planet, um, well, another thing that makes this complicated is that the rebellion was taking place on three different levels. There's the celestial administration of the system, which is the system government level. This is a system projected to be approximately a thousand worlds, but it's incomplete. But this is a subunit, administrative subunit within the local universe. So there's the system government. That's where the, that's where the rebellion started, with Lucifer, because he was the system sovereign. He was the head of the system. And he's not an angel, technically. He's what the Imagine Book refers to as a Lenonindex son. So he's, he's the offspring of Michael and the mother spirit. And he's, these beings are created as administrators. Okay. In any case, so there's the system administrative level. Then there's the celestial administration of the inhabited worlds, like this one. And then there's the mortal level on the inhabited worlds. The rebellion was taking place on all three levels. It started at the, at the administrative level of the system, 
From there, it was spread by Satan, Lucifer's first lieutenant, was spread to the celestial administration of the inhabited evolutionary worlds, and from there, it spread to the human level on the evolutionary worlds. So what we see in our world today is you know, the, the outworking of the tenets of the Lucifer Manifesto, which included unlimited self-liberty, denial of the existence of God, and all these kinds of things led to tremendous destruction. The rebellion has ended at the level of the system administration. The rebellion has even ended at the level of the celestial administration of the inhabited worlds, including this one. So we have a loyal administration, celestial administration on this planet. But the rebellion has not ended on the human level on this planet. So according to the policies that are described in the Arantia book, because the rebellion is still ongoing on the human level on this planet, Calgastia must remain free as the leader of the rebellion. And the time frame projections in the Arantia book as to how long it's going to take to reach this point of final adjudication, which is not the court judgment, it's the judgment on the part of every personality involved is the Arantia book's meaning of the term adjudication. So the adjudication is not the same as the verdict coming from the universe court. The verdict has already passed. What has not happened is every personality, even on the human level, coming to a point of final decision about the rebellion. And because that has not happened, Caligastian must remain free. That's what the Arantia book says. And the time frame projections of this easily take more than 100,000 years before this planet comes back to its normal status in terms of being free of deliberate evil. So this is, this is another thing that's kind of important to understand about rebellion. Even on a, what the Arantia book calls a normal world, there's the presence of evolutionary evil. So selfishness, greed, even war, hatred, all these kinds of things, these are just normal part of evolutionary development. What's not normal is deliberate evil, which is a calculated thing, where you do evil on purpose. And that's the Arantia book, uh, the Arantia book defines that as sin. So the Arantia book has its own particular definitions for these terms of evil and sin. And I think it's very important to understand the meanings that the Arantia book uses with these terms, because it's all tied up with rebellion. So as, as Byron was saying, rebellion is brought to this world. This is not something that would ordinary, ordinarily occur naturally within the human evolution. It comes from the superhuman level. And it's totally devastating, because it knows no, no moral restraint. <clears throat> So the sophistries of deliberate evil and unrestrained self-will grow out of the Lucifer Manifesto. And you can see that in the headline. You can see that every day in the paper. I mean, this is ongoing on this world. So where you do something deliberately that you know is going to hurt other people for your own self-gain, that's an example of deliberate evil. If you get caught up in a, you know, a crime of passion or you know, whatever, that's just normal evolutionary evil. So there is this distinction. And Lucifer and Caligastia are the champions, the advocates of this unrestrained, unbridled self-liberty, which leads to all you know, these, this category of problem that is particularly devastating. So the uh, policy that's articulated over and over again in the Arantia book as to the completion of adjudication. Again, remembering that adjudication is not the reaching of a verdict. It's the uh, ending of all sympathy for the rebellion. So just one more passage, and then I'll, I'll pass this on. Speaking of this uh, matter of um, verdict versus adjudication, uh, we read, if the, if the universe rebel against the reality of truth and goodness refuses to approve the verdict, which is what's going on in this case, and if the guilty one, guilty one knows in his heart 
the justice of his condemnation, but refuses to make such confession, which is also what's going on, then must the execution of sentence be delayed in accordance with the discretion of the Ancients of Days. And the Ancients of Days refuse to annihilate any being until all moral values and all spiritual realities are extinct, both in the evil doer and in all related supporters and possible sympathizers. So this extends all the way down to the human level. And human attitudes toward rebellion are very, very important because we have a high universe destiny. So if these rebel beings are annihilated while there's still sympathy, then that would just become a seed for future rebellion. So the policy of the universe is to let rebellion run its course however long it takes. And the estimates are that it's going to be somewhere between 100,000 and 800,000 years before this planet is finally free of this problem. But see, the thing you have to remember is that this is actually an opportunity. This is a spiritual opportunity to live in the presence of rebellion. It's like, it's like the difference between the sexes. You know, everything, you know, th this is a challenge that we can, that causes this particular kind of growth that has tremendous value in the universe. So we are given an opportunity to live on this planet in the presence of rebellion, which means that we will achieve spiritual insights that uh, mortals that are on a normal world will never have an opportunity to reach. It doesn't mean rebellion is a good thing, but good comes from it, from those who follow and seek the will of God. Thank you, Chuck. Well said. There were some terms in there maybe we should define just real quickly. So he used the term satania, which is the name of the local uh, system, system of... That's where the rebellion took place. Where it is. So satania was a terrible name, satania. I don't know where they came up with that. Well, Satan was a high being, just like Lucifer. Yeah. These were glorious, brilliant beings. He wanted, didn't want to call it Luciferia. <laughs> they yeah. call it satania. Anyway, uh, there were some other terms. Um, he met, uh, Chuck mentioned, uh, <coughs> let's see. This gets a little, it's a little bit more technical uh, discussion. Were there any anybody have any questions about any of these terms and any because it was complicated and I appreciate your patience with with us in putting this out. Uh, okay, any questions about any of the terms? So so the the, the timeline you got it and uh, so the yes. So, um, was Cal Caligastia. Caligastia. Yeah, he's the leader on this planet. He was what they referred to as the planetary prince. He was the one that established the first... Um, first epical revelation. revelation. Right. right. So his name, as I said, was Caligastia. The questioner asked whether... Uh, oh, who he is. So now he is... Uh, he was allowed to continue on the planet even after Jesus was here. As the, the arrangement, as Chuck explained, was... Let them continue with this and let them show how hideous they are. And as, as, as we get a good glimpse of this, we're going to be done with rebellion. You know, so Chuck is saying this would take much longer on our planet than what uh, the other school of thought says, that we're done with that. And <laughs> the celestials believe that it's over and they removed him. And we, I didn't state, and I'll let the others discuss it, that he, he was... Calgastia was annihilated at the moment of the adjudication because he decided to be annihilated. He self-annihilated. So did Lucifer and so did some of the other rebels. But the rest of the rebels had a choice. Everyone has a choice in, 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 in heaven when you're being punished, when you've been indicted and convicted. You choose. You have to choose and agree to the, to the, to the punishment, so to speak. So we, we believe that he's... But it's because they, if they don't, then all sympathy for them has to end before they will be annihilated. Right, so because this is... Because they'll be annihilated against their will. Right. So that's what the Urantia book is talking about, is these beings being annihilated against their will, which the universe administrators will not do until all sympathy for them ends. When you say their will, you mean the will of... Uh, of the, the whole, rebels. Uh, of the rebels, right. So yes. the rebels on, on Urantia, on our planet, still well, have sympathy, and we can't... We can't right. Caligastia, according to the Urantia book, is still very much on this planet. And, and his minions are still following Human. him. 
Human, yes. Humans, and, yeah. you know, whoever they may <clears throat> yeah, be. Yeah, there's no more uh, rebel angels or anything like that. They've all been removed. Right. But there's definitely human. Human sympathizers with. Yes, right. You know, there's the stories that, you know, Hitler had seances and brought in beings and who I guided and that, things but, of that nature. But, these are, uh, you know, these are pro, pro, you know, <clears throat> ur urban myths. But, you know, there's a lot of stories of uh, that sort of interaction. So that I think is what we're talking about. And those people that still follow the, this idea of really a sadistic view of life, which is they, they're not just evildoers. They enjoy it. They like it. They're, they're misanthropic. They, they do evil on purpose. As a strategy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so now the other panelists, it's uh, time for you. We'll give you five minutes or less. And uh, <laughs> this is not an easy one, but... No, again, you know, this is, uh, I see these are different faith positions, so that's why we're calling this an interfaith dialogue. I just want to, um, I just want to share an experience I had with uh, the teachers. I'm not going to talk about the rebellion um, because it gets too complicated for me, but I do want to let you know that the first 10 years of this, of me hearing about the teaching mission, I was very much opposed to it. And the reason for that there's a passage in the Arantia book on uh, the faith of Jesus, and it talks about how he uh, connected with his indwelling adjuster. And I'll read a quote here. Uh, he connected not by leadings, voices, visions, or extraordinary religious practices. He simply, this is my own words, connected through his faith. And this quote... Um, pretty much put the hammer on the teaching mission for me. You know, I just, uh, I actually avoided people that were involved in it. Byron could attest to that. So what changed my mind? Well, I think it was um, the spring of 2000. I had heard a friend of mine, a very dear friend down in Costa Rica, was channeling or tiaring, so to speak. Two friends, actually. And at the time, um, I guess you'd say I was going through so, somewhat of a crisis in my life, and I decided, well, I'm going to go down there. I want to go down there and find out what is really going on. Leading up to this, um, I had several what I would call openings of the heart, events, that uh, healings, that, where I was able to experience an opening of my heart. So when I went, was heading down there, there was more of an openness in me, more of a willingness to receive. I had moved out of my mind a little bit and was into my heart. Well, I got down there. I hadn't seen my good friend Oliver for, you know, probably maybe 10 years. And uh, we had a wonderful time. We spoke long into the night. And uh, the next morning... Uh, shortly after he made breakfast, he asked if he can have an opportunity to TR for me. And I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. I'd already told him what I, how I felt about it. I felt we don't need an intermediary between us and our adjusters. Well, we go out in the veranda. He sits down. He sits back. He closes his eyes. I close my eyes, and he starts talking. It probably didn't take uh, I think in the first few words. I'm sorry. Anyway, the love that I felt was so real. I knew it was real from that moment on. I become uh, a transmitter myself. 
I asked for a personal teacher. It's like, um, you know, I love people, I love friends, and now I have these uh, friends that I can't see, but I can recognize their personalities. Anyway, that's one of the reasons why I don't want to speak today. I get very emotional. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I apologize. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Thank you for speaking from the heart. Thank you, Rick. Let's continue with Meredith. I am really glad you offered the opportunity to me to participate on this panel, Byron, because I think the issue of ongoing revelation really needs to be discussed by the Urantia movement and by our wider society. I think there's ongoing confusion on the issue. Uh, first, I, I, I do want to acknowledge, Chuck, that I don't know whether the Lucifer Rebellion has been adjudicated or not. You know, I really don't think anyone in the room can know that for sure. So, so I want to focus on other things. I think that there's confusion about, uh, about Christ. Some people uh, question whether he was just an interesting guy, and others uh, think that he brought a revelation to the planet. Uh, I think there's disagreement about revelation and authenticity of revelation in the Urantia papers. Oh, this concept of the material coming through a sleeping subject sounds uh, spacey at best, and materialized papers is even more suspicious. Should we believe A Course in Miracles appeared in mysterious ways? And if two ladies say that they are hearing messages from God and write about it in uh, God Calling, or Neil Walsh has conversations with God, should we believe their claims? If teaching mission transmitters claim that they receive messages from Michael, the angels, and Makavena Melchizedek, do they really? And the most difficult question of all, if you had a vision last night of God asking you to do something that might be scary or difficult or risky, was it real? <laughs> Should you go do it? These are issues each of us must wrestle with. And people generally tend to come down on two sides of the coin. Either one, they believe it's all true, or two, it's a scam, it's a fraud, it's a, an illusion. I believe, however, that the truth is somewhere in between, that it lies in the gray. The Urantia book tells us that our thought adjusters yearn to communicate more fully with us, but that the electrical imbalances in our physical bodies on this material plane make that extremely difficult. We do learn that the more we become aligned with God's will, the easier it is to hear him. You mentioned the role of midwayers in communication. You um, didn't mention that particular aspect. I think it's good to know both. Nevertheless, it's very difficult to try to live the spiritual life when we never know for sure whether the guidance we think we've received is a true revelation or not. And I want to read a, paper, a paragraph from the Urantia book on the subject. It's in paper 159. Forewarn all believers regarding the fringe of conflict which must be traversed by all who pass from the life as it is lived in the flesh to the higher life as it is lived in the spirit. To those who live quite wholly within either realm, there is little conflict or confusion. But all are doomed to experience more or less uncertainty during the times of transition between the two levels of living. If you're 
a material person in a material world and you don't think beyond that, you're not going to be that confused about it. <laughs> and if you're living up in heaven, it may be clear too. But if you're in transition from one to the other, expect confusion. They end... Uh, in entering the kingdom, you cannot escape its responsibilities or avoid its obligations. But remember, the gospel yoke is easy and the burden of truth is light. I think that it is easy to give up trying to discern whether revelation is real or not. Some of us... Uh, tell ourselves we're just going to stay home until uh, the Ten Commandments arrive on, on a stone, stone slate. Uh, others uh, will only consider believing something if it arrives in written form that's been copyrighted, like the Bible or the Urantia book. And I believe that all of these sources are inspired, but not one is inerrant, and none offers personalized guidance. I think the Urantia book gives us a model of the way to progress spiritually, and that model is the life of Jesus. In fact, we're told that if there's only one piece of information you can know in this world, the most important thing you can know is the spiritual life of Jesus and how he lived it. And the model that Jesus portrayed for us is of chatting with Father on a daily basis, talking to him, listening for answers, and stepping out and acting. Okay. I want to give Chuck a chance to respond and... Uh, and, and the others as well, very briefly, just responding to what you've heard. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, just very briefly. Uh, what I would like to stand up for is the idea of each of us developing our own voice. I feel like the spiritual challenge in our lives is to develop our own voice. The, the Arantia book, when it um, talks about God's presence within our minds, actually coined a new word, created a new concept for us, which is the concept of pre-personality. And I think this is um, just a very important and profound new concept. It opens the way toward a new approach to God consciousness that is unprecedented, I, I, I think. And <clears throat> what this suggests is that the spirit of God within us finds personal expression through our personality. So my adjuster speaks with my voice. The Spirit of God within me speaks with my voice. So the, the, the revelation of the Arantia book is not a fixed thing. I also believe that the revelation is growing and that there is ongoing revelation. But I think it's very important that that ongoing revelation happen in the authentic voice of the individual so that it's accountable. So my ideas are my ideas. I'll stand behind them. I'll argue them, I'll change them if need be, but they're my ideas, and I seek to have God find expression through me, not through a separate, uh, dissociated ego identity. Okay. Anything else in closing? Uh, may I just yes, you may. You may. One thing here that I want to respond to. Um, what I want to uh, say is that the the essence, the most important thing that I've gotten out of my experience with the teachers is an opening and a communication with my indwelling father fragment, with my adjuster. And that's one of the greatest gifts that I've gotten out of this. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah, well, I'd applaud any, well, yes. <laughs> any experience along those lines. So. And, and I'll let uh, Mayor have the last word. If anything, years of experience trying to seek personal revelation has taught me. It's that, A, sometimes I get divinely inspired messages that transform my life, and that, B, sometimes I get it all wrong. And the honest truth is, I can't tell the difference between the two. Yet, the overall experience has led to tremendous spiritual growth, opportunities, and untold joy, and fruits of the Spirit. And I'm committed to the path of attempting to discern 
what revelation is valid and what isn't. And I believe that Father, Father's will will prevail when our will is aligned to his, regardless of our understanding or our confusion.